Welcome to Every Night is Game Night, because we all love game nights with our family and friends. But when you play solo games, then every night can be a game night. Check us out, along with other great podcasts, at Dicetowernetwork.com. Every Night is Game Night, episode 125, Kickstarter Roundup, The Wild Purple Cat Garden. Yo, my peoples, what's up? Welcome back to the Every Night is Game Night podcast. I'm your host, Jason. Thank you so, so much for joining us. As always, as we do, uh, whenever we do these Kickstarter Roundup episodes, we have two for you. Why? Because we are having a good time, hanging out. Uh, we bang these out one at a time. Um, Jeremy from Jambalaya Plays Games. Hopefully, he has not collapsed in a heap from the scotch that he's drinking uh, over at his house in Wisconsin. Jeremy, you still with us? Man, I'm still with you, man. I'm trying to stay hot. Trying to keep my chest hot. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, we got we're about to have like below forty wind chill coming up here, man. So, oh, uh, we're getting snow, Liz. What a snow! I get yeah. a snow day tomorrow. It's a good thing. Yeah. That's right, Liz. Wow, you got uh, a pre-snow day. We did. <laughs> there's, well, there's like one snow plow in the city of Atlanta or something like that. Oh, so you know, <laughs> that, that is Liz from from uh, Beyond Solitaire. Sorry about that. <laughs> We just barreled right through the introduction right there. That's okay. Everyone knows me. No kidding. Hi, I'm Liz. I'm from Beyond Solitaire, and I usually Kickstarter Kickstarter correspondent here on Engine. So this is, it's funny because we were just talking about like just hanging out, keeping warm, and so me and Jeremy, we live in cold weather climate. You live in Michigan for crying out loud, right? Oh, you live in Wisconsin. I love Wisconsin. To me, the same thing. Like, we could get dumped on, like, 14, 15, 20 inches of snow. All right, go to work the next day or go to school the next day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But don't, been... even, don't, don't even, you know, like, this is that first, this is the first year, though, where I feel that there's a, there's a tide turning where they actually cancel school the day before. Mm. And I remember, you know how you used to get up in the morning and you would wait. You wait for that line to come across the screen, like, please close, please close, please close. This is the first time I had it where they canceled the day before. And I was just like, wow, I think this is the moment where it changes, you know, and <laughs> yeah, you, lo and behold, yeah, we did get eight to 12 inches. Guess what? Uh, my boss is like, yeah, you can come to work like an hour late, but you got to get here, man. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> no mercy. <laughs> Meanwhile, we got, uh, we got Liz down there in Atlanta. I know we have international listeners. Like we have a couple of listeners in like Uruguay and stuff. They're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> 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 know that we're talking about American states, the Northern states. We love snow. The southern states, if you if you see a fleck, if you see a tiny thing hit the, the road, they're like, oh, sorry, cancel school. Everybody stay home. I hate you guys. <laughs> 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 All right. So we are having a good time over here at Every Night is Game Night. Uh, we have four more Kickstarter projects for you uh, that have been hitting our table. We have been enjoying them and having a good time. But first, we are going to get to another live Kickstarter project. Uh, I'm not sure if this actually this one is actually live yet, uh, but it may be by the time we hit this episode. But it'll definitely be very soon. Uh, we are going to throw it once again to in Jeremy. We trust Jeremy. You were talking about this crazy Chinese astrological sign game or something like that. Yeah. Oh man, I'm trying to. I, I was scrambling here for this sheet of paper because I can't remember the designer. <laughs> I can't remember the designer. But uh, this is for the Race for the Chinese Zodiac. It's going to be a Kickstarter, to, I think, on, uh, was it the 29th? Um, so, yeah, it's a it's a, basically a race game where you're using these cards um, to select actions. And you're, you're competing Zodiac creatures. So you got, like, the rabbit, the tiger, um, the monkey, all these different things, the pig. It's, it's from the Simply Complex line. So if you, know, um, if you know Capstone games, they're known for kind of their heavier games. And they have these sim simple games that are simpler games, I should say, that are really smart. Ragusa was one I think they brought up. I'm not sure if that's simply complex, but it's kind of like in their lower weight line. And I think this one just has a beautiful theme. The cards are absolutely ridiculous. And, of course, like I said, it's Chinese Zodiac. Race for the Zodiac. So it will be either live on Kickstarter uh, as we race, launch. Sorry, oh. Race for the Chinese Zodiac. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, it's not race for the Gemini and Leo and all that stuff. This is the Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So this is Race for the Chinese Zodiac. It'll be either live right now or will be soon live. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, I, I, like I said, man, I don't know what I would do without you. I get you get all you give me all these crazy projects from all over left field. It's great. I should, I should say before you even think about this, uh, I should say uh, there's a one small thing you should know that it's a weird player count. It's three to five players, and it only just takes it takes you know like one action out of the wheel and something like that. But I like to let people know that, and it takes about uh, first place. I was to say yeah, about 75, 90 minutes. Yeah, it's about that play play time. All right, so let us get into some games, more games. Uh, this is what you guys tune into ENGN for. Uh, so we have a couple of that we're going to talk about today. Uh, this first one is a existing game. Uh, this game was released, I believe, in like 2010, like a really a long time ago as a print and play. Uh, but it has gotten official printing uh, by Luda Creations. Uh, this is a kind of cult classic, uh, which has finally seen the light of day publicly wise. This is Mr. Cabbage Head's Garden Game, designed by Todd Sanders. Liz, you're up. Absolutely. All right, so Mr. Cabbage Head's Garden is this really quirky-looking game. Like, the cover alone, I'm pretty sure that Sanders is inspired by these, like, Victorian-era seed packets. So it's a game about these anthropomorphic vegetables. And essentially, you are a Mr. Cabbage Head. You're, like, a vegetable man who is trying to grow a vegetable garden in order to get a blue ribbon uh, in the local gardening society and also impress um, the beautiful Eudora, who is another anthropomorphic vegetable. Um, (laughs) So basically, like, what the game what the game compri- is mostly comprised of turn to turn is you are drafting vegetables and you're trying to put them in configurations in your garden that are going to score you points because more points means a better ribbon at the end of the game. So you're trying to place you know the same kinds of vegetables next to each other because they only score if they are orthogonally adjacent to other vegetables of the same type. But there are also different layouts in this. Um, it's rows of six. No, three rows with six columns in them um, to make this garden. And you are, um, you're trying to, you can do like the promenade where you have certain pairs that are next to each other. Or you can try to get different kinds of vegetables per row or all these different little ways of getting bonuses. And, you know, you think that you have some control over this, except every few turns you go on holiday and your annoying neighbors, one of them will come to your garden and take one of your vegetables. Those jerks. I know, it's so rude. It's so rude. <laughs> so, yes. you, you can do a little bit of predicting. So you're drawing these neighbor tokens. So the thing that's interesting about the drafting is that the card that you pick isn't just about the vegetable. It's about how many neighbor tokens are going to get drawn depending on the card you leave on the table. And it's about the proximity of cards to your beehive, because with some cards, you gain a bee for taking that card, and others you pay one. So you can accidentally lock yourself up in terms of putting cards on your board, depending on like how you've managed your resources. Um, but you, you draw these neighbor tokens, and each neighbor has a different preference and will take a different kind of vegetable. And so your job is to kind of watch that and maybe try to mitigate some potential damage in your garden. And you'll be making decisions like with an eye to what might get swiped on an upcoming holiday. What do you think? I really like it. I think it's charming. It's fun. It's quick. I mean, it's a little lucky because you're drawing cards, but that's fine. There's a lot that you can do strategically to try to bump your score. I think it is a lot of fun. And honestly, a game that weird looking, it's, I'm so charmed by it. <laughs> I'm not the hugest fan of Todd Sanders' general games, if that makes sense. Like, I get it. Like, I get that it's, like, the art style is quirky, and he he, he does a lot with a little, which I'd normally like. I just right. find his designs kind of mathematical, if that makes sense, or a little bit kind of, like, I don't, there's a lot of style to it. I don't get the, it doesn't feel all very organic. It feels kind of clunky. And I'm talking about other games of his, uh, I think of the the Draugr in particular. I, I like the Draugr okay. Um, and I, I know there are other people that are going to like it. It just wasn't for me. Uh, a couple of other games that are escaping me right now. Pulp so Detective. I was like, yeah, yeah, well, Pulp I haven't, I've actually, I've actually played Pulp Detective. I'll, I'll be interested in looking at that one because it looks a little bit more thematic. Uh, Jeremy, I know you haven't had a, too much of a chance to play this because you're still waiting for your copy, but you've no, played but it I, in the past, I, I fussed right? With, I fussed with it a while back. I, print, I think I printed it out back then. Um, I like this game a lot. I like uh, Todd. Actually, I reached out because of this 
and something else I think I played of his um, to do a preview for Pulp Detective. So um, this is one of the reasons why. I just like smart little games. And yes, it's down to the cards, but it's just like it's a nice little system. And and if you didn't know me, I, a lot of people don't know this, but like I'm, I'm kind of like a backpack person. So I like to have a lot of little card games that I can just whip out and play. They don't have to change the world. They just have to be fun for a little while. And I feel like this is just one of them. It's another one of those. And I like that he does choose these little, you know, weird themes. They work just enough, just enough. Um, and that this one does. It works just enough. And, and that's all I ask. I mean, outside of that, like Liz covered the, the car play just perfectly fine. I mean, that's what it is. It's a, it's a working puzzle. And it and I'll be honest with you, I do agree with it being mathy. It's really just math covered up in these like beautiful sheets. But he gets away with it. He cares. At least he cares about that. And it could just be a really you know a drab game, you know. But it's not, you know. That's I guess that's what it feels like. I feel like it's kind of sneaking in the these math puzzles around this like crazy yeah. Victorian thing, and it's like okay. <laughs> Yeah. I'm, I'm, well, glad, you know, I'm glad you said it. A, but that's a thing, though. Like, that's a thing. You know how, like, somebody will say, like, it for what it is. Like, they'll throw that tag on things. And I feel like for this game, it's like, you know what? Sometimes you can't just, you know, you can just kind of half do a card game. But what if you just, you know, you try to really sell somebody on the thing. Let's just try, you know? And that's what this was. I, I feel like that was the way it was from the start. It wasn't meant to be, like, just some regular old, hey, this is this and that. I played a game like this called Stew. And I was thinking to myself, like, no, they, they actually cared. They actually cared about this thing. He really went all in on these cards, man. Mm-hmm. Really okay. went on on these cards. I really mean, I, I'll game. play anything. Like, I, I love, like, again, doing a lot with a little. And it's a game that's pretty popular. And, and Liz, you like it. So I'll definitely take a look at it. Um, so I'm, I'm going off of your recommendation there. So good, good on you. <laughs> you worked on one person. So do you play games? Do you take games with you? Like that's the, the the big one with me is I'm kind of an open book for games because I do take a lot with me like little card right. games things like, like that. Cabbage Head's a good like lunch break game. Like right. I got a bunch of plays in this past week because you know when my students were on break or it was lunch I'll just take it out and play it. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually uh, the the last game we're going to talk about is a game that I'm I've started to take with me more and more and more. But we'll get to that. <laughs> um, so that was Mr. Cabbage Head's Garden Game, again designed by Todd Sanders. Finally seeing the light of day, publishing wise from Luda Creations. Uh, let us get to a game that Liz and I have both played. Um, this is Dire Wild. This one was designed by Vass. Oh, you're gonna have to help me out here, Liz. This is not gonna work out. <laughs> hey, I'm gonna look at the spell in here. <laughs> OBS care, OBS care. Oh man. <laughs> You have to fly in there and uh, see if you could f- correct oh, man, my pronunciation. I have no idea. It's, <laughs> it's uh, you pronounce every letter because I don't know. Well, I should have asked the publisher. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> it is published by Iron Horde Games. We're just having fun with the man. <laughs> uh, we definitely. <laughs> <laughs> this was the worst that we've ever failed on pronunciation. How terrible! <laughs> I'm not. I'm hey, not. A, we can't, nice we can't win them all. <laughs> I'm not even drinking scotch. I don't drink. <laughs> <laughs> I have no Get excuse. Have fun, man. All right. But we're going to get to Dire Wild right now. This was actually the, the maiden voyage for Iron Horde Games uh, in terms of publishing. So this is a deck building cooperative dungeon crawler. Um, so this is something like I, I, I consider this kind of game like a like a white whale because they're like deck building is hot. Like you can you can't even shake a leg without you know uh you know some new deck builder out there and also dungeon crawling so like you know there's tons of dungeon crawls just look on kickstarter there's always one live always you know and finding one that actually merges these two hot things they people have been kind of going at those a couple of times they've been a couple of false starts with them so this is another one and it's gonna it's taking a crack and it's let's see if it's the one that really busts through um so this so for this one I, I would say, Liz, um, it, this one leans more towards a deck building side of things, right? Would you say? Yeah, I would say definitely does. Yeah. So then the, the the take on deck building, though, and what makes this thing a little bit interesting is that – so in Dire Wild, you're, again, I, I feel like we we're playing these games with, like, you know, um, creatures instead of, like, human beings. <laughs> so a lot of, like, cute, fuzzy creatures that are, like, just kind of, like, turning into stuff. I mean, so in this game, it is – more likable than people, so. I guess so. <laughs> 
So in this game, you're going to be playing, you know, it's a standard deck builder. You're going to be playing cards. And the cards all depict these animals, right? Uh, so, like, you know, you start with a hand of puppies and kittens, of all things. And then as you purchase cards and play cards, you're going to be purchasing these advanced cards. First from a common deck, which is, you know, these, you know, pretty decent cards. But eventually you're going to want to break out the advanced deck, which is like, you know, big things, you know, lizards and T-Rexes and insects and, you know, big scorpions and all that kind of stuff. So your deck is going to get bigger and better that way. The reason why it's important to know that they're kind of animals is that the, there's two different phases to the deck building. First, obviously you're playing cards for money, you know, or charm, you're charming monsters. Uh, second, you're actually kind of putting them together in these like Pokemon ways of yeah. making making <laughs> monsters. So, you know, at the at the beginning, you're going to have like one puppy and then you're going to, you know, take your kitten card, turn them upside down and there's going to be like, you know, the smart cute puppy and that's your creature and that's you're going to use that to attack the creatures on the board. But then once you buy creat you're going to buy more advanced animals. It's going to turn into like, you know, the you know, iron fisted, uh, the scorpion of doom or something like that. And then, you know, the, and the, those are all cars that you've combined. So like these are two separate phases, that's the second phase and that's how you influence the board. So I thought that was pretty interesting, right? Like I've never played like a Pokemon esque creature building game before, you know, you can definitely tell these guys have played a million deck builders and okay, we're going to do it this way. We've noticed these problems. We're going to fix the, some problems that you have with deck builders and keep going. Um, yes. The next part of the game is that it's a dungeon crawler. So there's basically one scenario that plays out over three different maps. And then in all the missions, there's basically there's one minion per player that is on the board. And they're kind of automated. They're not very they don't very exciting. But then there's this big bad called Karn. Karn is this kind of looming threat that looms over the initial scenarios. And then the last scenario, you just, you know, go beat Karn. Uh, and you know, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that works out for you. Um, and the way the game does it is it's very, you, like, you have to improve your deck. You have to improve your deck. If you don't improve your deck, you can't even hit the, the minions. So that game kind of forces you to be really, really smart, be really aggressive with your deck building. It's not like, oh, you know, I'm just going to hit this guy. I'm going to get this loot. No, <laughs> just, just go right after the deck, you know, like, you know, it really challenges you to build the best deck that you can uh, and, and bef as you get into the last part. Uh, I, that's, that's it to me. Like, I mean, I think that's the basic rhythm of the game. Did I forget anything, Liz? Is there anything like gameplay wise that's important? No, I think that about covers it. Um, so, so my first question is you, what do you, what do you think is the most interesting thing about the game? Like just without a doubt, you're like, this is the biggest plus of the game that you're, you know, like biggest selling point of the game. The, Other than the, cute animals. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing I do want to talk right. about for Dire Wild is that Jason's point about they've pl clearly played a lot of deck builders and wanted to fix some of the problems that typically occur with them. It's definitely clear that some mechanical decisions in Dire Wild have been made to improve on some stuff. So if you have sort of extra charm, like you know in a lot of deck builders, if you have like loose change, you don't you, you just waste money on yeah. a turn if you can't yeah. spend it all. So Dire Wild actually gives you a lot of options for how to use additional charm. So there's several upgrades that you can slowly unlock by spending charm on the locks as you go. So you can become more powerful that way. Oh, you can nice. also spend a little bit of charm to put something on top of your deck as opposed to in your discard pile or to charm a creature that's from the wild that's not quite on the row yet. Love those. So yep. basically, those are no key. matter... Those are key little strategies. You know, like, I like those. Right. So basically, you never have no use for your money. Right. Which I think is really great because, you know, it sucks to have a big money turn and nothing that you want to buy. Or, like, an awkward amount of stuff to buy. So, that's something that I... I mean, it's all the little touches in Dire Wild that I, you can see as a Maiden Voyage game, especially. There's so much care that's going into it. I'm really curious to see what Iron Horde will do next. Um, the rule book is also spectacular. Very clear. Ooh. Ooh! Bonus! Yeah. Yeah. The, the you asked the question, what is the main show? The main show is the deck building, and the main show is the way that the cards are multi-use. You, you use them to buy other cards, but you also use them to create these creatures and attack. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. like, and you're doing both things with the same hand. Right. And there's different strategies to, like, like, approach it. And you can, you have to, like, adjust depending on what the river gives you. It's kind of that, that river system where you don't, it's constantly, like, different cards that you're coming out. So, you might get a lot of birds. So then, okay, I'm going to make a bird deck. And bird decks tend to give you a lot of, like, draw. 
you know, or I'm yeah. going to make an insect deck and it's like, okay, if I have this many insects in my discard, my animal does this much, this much extra damage. So it has that, you know, that that's what you're here for deck building. It's very smart. And it, the, the attacking is probably the more interesting part. I actually was, so this is a, a couple of criticisms. I actually wasn't as into like the actual currency of it. It really, because of the way the way the game kind of pushes you so hard towards, oh, be as powerful as humanly possible so that you can even have a prayer of hitting these creatures. So the, the, the creatures, they don't have a turn where they hit you. What they do is you go up to them and it's it's weird because they have a movement phase, but they don't have an attack phase. So they let roll up to you, and they're like, "Okay, well, come at me, bro. Come at me. Huh? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do?" And it's like, "Okay." <laughs> <laughs> they only attack if you miss. So if you go and you don't hit their armor, they're gonna do damage to you, which yeah, it prioritizes. Like I have to get the biggest monsters possible. So you have to get like if you don't open the advanced deck early, you're boned. And if you don't get cards that are worth two charm, like they, they cost five, they're worth two, right. you're boned. And I I guess it, it kind of funneled you towards certain cards, like get this, you must get this. These other cards, eh. You know, I, I think they could have done a little bit of a better job kind of with the balance of the different cards, especially when it came to the charm. And, you know, the other thing, that, and I know you mentioned this in your review, Liz, because you mm -hmm. did, I know you did a blog review. I did, the culling, yeah. Yeah, it's culling? really hard to call. Culling is not a it's not a thing you can buy. I wish it was. Like I wish you could just spend a, spend a, some money and just like, you know, start culling your deck. Like there's only a few cards that let you call. So those you you get those cards like, "Oh, give me." <laughs> and they're not even that perfect in the sense that like, you know, like call a, like I think one of the ducks or something, call a card in your discard pile. Well, sometimes I have a discard pile where I like it and I don't and there's nothing to call. Or, and it's, so that that it's kind of a little bit clunky that way. The way that the game chose to deal with that issue is like way more powers that let you mill cards. So like draw two, draw one, draw two. Da, 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 you know, you so you do, you're doing this constant drawing, constant cycling. But it wasn't as cool as it could have been because I'm doing all of that to deal with these crappy cards that I started with. <laughs> I wish that either those crappy cards became good. Or I could just get rid of them so I can like right. really have an awesome deck as opposed to just having this tripe in my hand that I'm cycling through, but the cycling through is to get rid of garbage, not to be more awesome. I, don't, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Uh, although I, I do have to say that when you do get to quit destroy cars, it's unintentionally hilarious because you're destroying your starter puppy and kitten cards. Oh, yeah. You're, you're there's, just, there's, a, there's a mild darkness to that that I can't help but enjoy. Um, <laughs> Um, the other thing I had to say is, okay, so I like the combination of deck building and dungeon crawling, but I, I also think there's a little bit of a pacing issue in the game. Like, you can save between each of the tile levels, but uh, the whole game feels a little dragged out. Okay. A little bit, yeah. For me, and because it's sort of that same pattern in the same three levels every time, I've played it, you know, when you played a whole bunch of times in a row for review, it's like... <sighs> oh, okay. Yeah, for me. Fair. Yeah. It's a little bit, it reminded me of One Deck Dungeon in the sense of like, you in One Deck Dungeon, you're playing and you get to a certain power level and it's like, all right, I'm ready for the big boss. Now, where is he? Right. Oh, I have how many doors left? Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. That's, that's so, what I was trying to get a vibe of. Like, there's not really a story here. It's more like, a, you know, we're going to go through three of these or two of these or whatever, and then we're finishing right. it up. Okay. Okay. I mean, right. that's fine. It's not like the end of the world, though. So. No, it's not the end of the world. It's, it's Maybe it's a little bit too long, and I think the deck building is a little bit... I, I wish that they took a little bit of a different approach, like in the way I described. Uh, don't have to go through all that again. But the, this is this, this is edge case stuff. It's not like it's not. These aren't deal killers. It's this is a very solid thing. It's really cute. And in yes. terms of that that combined, you know, building these Pokemon creatures, having that deck building experience in a way that's like plays out on a board. I actually was pretty into this. I'm not like we talked last week about Dawn of Peacemakers. Dawn of Peacemakers. Oh, <laughs> I love Dire Wild. Not quite as as it didn't grip me as much, but it's definitely very good. And if you if you like what you hear, I definitely would recommend giving it a look. Uh, Jeremy, are you a deck builder guy? I am a deck build and love a son of a gun. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm happy that they're oversaturating the market. I love. Deck oh builders. my god. <laughs> 
So what are your favorites? What are your favorites and, and how? Love, dude. What are your favorites and, so, and get? I was so on the fence with this game, so on the fence, and I and it's hard for me to be on the fence with a game that has like this, it kind of hits the beats. But I was like, I I really need to hear other people's reactions to this game because I feel like. I feel like it's a flame out. Like it's gonna be good, but it'll flame out real quick. And I just don't want it. I felt like that was too much of what was gonna go on with this game. And I'm right. thinking like maybe they'll re up and they'll come back to Kickstarter with this one. And when they re up and come back, I want to take another look at it and see what they did with it. Because it's I didn't see like there was anything bad. And what you're saying sounds really good actually. But I'm, I'm, if they come back to Kickstarter, I might really pay attention to what they're doing with this one. Uh, so right what are your now, what are your favorite on. deck building games and how and why are they your favorite? My favorite? Yeah. Well, Sharps Infinity right now is like just blowing everything away right now. It's just blowing everything away. It took it took everything that like Hero Realms and Star Realms, it just took them and just and then took Ascension and then added some other stuff. And then that just became a my ultimate right now. So that's my ultimate. Like Sharps is, is like the ultimate right now. Is um, it because it's so simple? Because in this game, they're trying to do a lot of things. Like they're trying to make a deck build, they're trying to make the yeah. future building, and they're yeah. trying to make it have impact on the board. Is that you know? It's so your deck. You tend towards kind of more simpler deck builders. Is that my reading? Yeah, right? yeah. And I it, and that's the thing. Like I don't, I don't mind that. What was that one that we had earlier this year or last year? Was it Dun- Dungeon Alliance? Is it yeah. Dungeon Alliance? Yeah. I, I mean, I thought yeah, like I, I thought that one. that one like that was heavier. So I mean, I like that too. I don't know. There was something on this one. That I was just like I don't know. Would I would I keep playing this one? And. uh Maybe it was one of those games where I felt like I wanted more story from it. Like when I hear you when you were talking about Down of the Peacemakers in the previous one, like that sounded rich to me, and I was like, I could oh, go yeah. all in on that. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know. And when I start going to these things where I say like, okay, let's say it's six scenarios or six situations, even if it's situations, and they call them, you know, like this kind of expansive story, I just need to feel like I want to play it over and over again. I just need to feel that. Mm-hmm. And uh, if they don't, I don't know if I'm going to buy it right away. Right away, I should say. So oh. What are your what are your favorite deck builders, Liz, and why? Ooh, okay. So, my I for for me, it's, it has to be Soulable to be a favorite. My current favorite is Aeon's End, which okay, I just really like. Yeah, it's, um, a, yeah, it's the goat. It's the goat. It's, it's great. <laughs> it's great. Like, Go. there's so many different bosses. There's so many different combos of you know different cards you can get. Mages. Um, I'm about to sit down and play some Aeon's End Legacy, which mm-hmm. I'm really excited to get going with. Um. I really like the non-shuffle mechanic because it lets you set up combos and it makes you have to think really hard about what is in your deck and in what order, which mm-hmm. I actually really enjoy as a twist. But Aeon's End is, is it for me in terms of deck builders right now. But um, and I also, one, you know, I... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, a, a couple subtle things that Aeon's End does that Die Wild does not do. So, first of all, Aeon's End, like, it, it does the same thing of that gives you things to do with your spare money, but it's, yeah. it's consistent. Um, in Aeon's End, you get a cool power. Right? right, so like you can fire off this thing, so like you can always do something with your spare money. The other thing that it does, and I, I didn't appreciate this until I played Dire Wild, was Aeon's End. There was you, you, you're stuck with your crappy cards, but towards the later part of the game, there's a lot of effects, a lot of effects that either do you damage, which means you have to discard your cards, or mm-hmm. discard six cards to deal with this power eight thing that's gonna blow up in your face, cost ten damage. It's like, oh, I have crappy cards i can discard boom and i feel really powerful with just as a mental trick i just dealt with a power eight thing with these cruddy cards and that's it, it's so subtle but i'm not fighting the deck i, I felt like i was fighting the deck a little bit in dire wild when i did not get mm-hmm. the culling cards that i wanted to yeah so yeah i know like, i'm focusing on the startup cards comparison. The starter, I, dude, yeah. that's like, I'm not a deck building guy just because I hate starter cards. I hate them. They're so stupid. <laughs> They're just like <laughs> empty pieces of cardboard in my hand. And like games, the whole project of the game is to like mi- mitigate it and deal with so, it and get rid of them, you know? So um, I don't want to go too far off of this deck building thing, but like how, how are you about deck deconstruction? Like have you played any of these games with deck deconstruction in it? I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> like, uh, so Fine Sand is a newer one by Freeman Freeze where it actually, like, you're trying to, like, basically it's a culling game. You're getting cards to basically make it so you can get rid of cards. You're getting cards that make a better engine of getting rid of cards. Mm-hmm. Um, or in Lincoln where you have cards that kind of represent, like, the two asymmetrical decks, but they basically, one, 
when you build certain cards, you have to get rid of other cards. And one, as the decks start to add uh, another sets of cards into them, you uh, get weaker cards for one person, and then you get better cards for the other person. Um, so there's a lot of like interesting things you can do with deck building, and I'll never discount anybody for you know trying different things. I just wanted to make sure that this game like has some stand power to it, and right. it doesn't seem like it. It doesn't seem like it doesn't. I'm just saying it doesn't have enough to like maybe go like jump over the hills for it. And I would definitely be looking forward to it if it had an expansion coming towards, like if something back in the Kickstarter. Like it's just one of those games like I mark for maybe an extra trade, maybe you know on a sale or maybe something like that. I tend to like multi-use cards more than yeah. deck builders, like where every card is good. And yeah. you're, you're constantly doing good stuff. And you're making decisions from turn one as opposed to kind of that slow ramp up. I get it. And then there's some, I mean, I love Aeon's End. That's a good, I, I'm also playing Legacy. Yeah. And I like Direwild. And I love the creatures. I love like, you know, yeah. what's, what are you here for? You're here to make cool creatures. You know, this is this is some rough edges that I perceive, but I mean, I can. I'm, at the end of the day, I'm going to give this a recommendation. If you guys like what you hear, that is dire wild. Um, but we're way far afield, and I want to <laughs> make sure we cover everything. I have I have not played this. Jeremy and Liz, we're really excited to get to this one. Um, so let me take a step back. We'll talk about deck building all you want. If you guys want to continue conversations, please hit us up on the Every Night is Game Night Facebook group. That's where we do a lot of our conversations. Uh, and we're always, you know, willing to kind of talk about stuff. But we are going to get back to the games. Uh, Jeremy, you really like this game. Uh, we're going to go with Donning the Purple. From yeah. Uh, yeah. So Donning the Purple is by, uh, what's it, Tom Pett. Tompet Games. Tompet uh, Games, yes. Tompet Games. Uh, yeah, Down in, the, Down in the Purple. It's one of three players. Uh, plays a little bit over an hour, hour and a half. I'm assuming that max player count. Um, and, yeah, it's it basically the emperors died. The Roman emperors died. I think it's, was it 190? Something like eight. Oh, yeah. The, they said it in 193. It's like the year of the five emperors. So it's like a Commodus gets assassinated, and there's like this year in Roman history where people are really fighting it out for the, uh, for the throne. There you go. What Liz said. Now. <laughs> Dude, we played, we played no, pandemic no, no. fall. I, 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 pause. I, I, I will, because I want I got to share this. We played, all three of us played pandemic fall of Rome with Liz. And the, the teacher was trying to teach us the game and like mispronouncing all the Latin. And oh, you could. Crazy. <laughs> it makes me crazy. It's so bad. It's so bad. <laughs> and we're like Liz it's 10 o'clock let her teach and you're like yeah. no <laughs> oh. <laughs> she has the pastiest face in the world let her get through this <laughs> <laughs> uh, I apologize man go ahead Don in the Purple alright so Don in the Purple basically you are one of three people you are uh, you're basically the, the senate you can be the senate person you could be the heir to the throne or you could actually be the emperor and you start the game out as one of the three. You all get your own board, but then one person, the emperor, the starting player emperor, gets the emperor piece, this extra piece that goes on to it. So what you have is like a 25 area, like a 25 little section map. You're going to have these big regions and then 25 provinces. And your job as the, you know, as the players is, is basically to be the emperor and try to score as many points as you can. Otherwise, you have to take other routes as either being the heir and trying to take it over when the when the, um, the, the emperor dies, or you can control through the senate as well, and you can manipulate how buildings and things come out. What players are doing are taking action. So they will, one, try to take out these, these enemies that are slowly progressing towards the capitals. You can like move your pawns across the board. You can bribe the senators, and the reason why you want to bribe the senators is because they give you they give you points at the end of the game. You also can assassinate each other. So what you're doing is you're playing these plot cards. Um, that help you fight against the people on the board, like these guys you're trying to take out. But they also help when you're trying to assassinate the emperor because you're placing these action tokens, and that's kind of like your life points uh, as the emperor. Like you're all kind of doing these things, you're placing these life points. There's so many different like little events that happen. Those five events that come out right in the middle of the game, they could just you know push the OS button to, for the whole round, and everybody's kind of scrambling, and the emperor's scrambling because they may not have enough actions. Um, yeah, but as a solo game, you're just playing as the emperor, and you're trying to survive, you know, and, and basically buy the air token. You, have, you can buy it, and you're trying to survive against the Senate, and the Senate just adds to the, um, just adds to the track, and they get 
they get coins for doing so. And your job is to basically take care of the food, take care, uh, collect the taxes, keep the people happy by taking out all these troops, and you score points according to that as well, like how happy the people are. And, uh, yeah, it's just a really interesting game. It's got a lot going on to it. I mean, Liz, I think this is like, this is like you, most definitely. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Like, when I played this game, I was, I was impressed by this game, but I think you would like, you would love this game. You would whip this one out quite a bit. Um, it's just a, it, it just has a lot of little interesting things going on to it. And the fact that those troops can come from anywhere, and just a, a, as a solo player having to deal with all those events coming out on your own, like, you're like, oh, man, how am I going to deal with all this stuff? I'm not going to have enough money. And the grain prices go up, and you're, you're like, oh, no, I don't have enough cash. There's just a lot going on in this game. Um, and, but it works. It works at all player counts. And if there was one more, it wouldn't actually make sense. Um, because all they're really doing with this emperor, this emperor part role, is once somebody gets, the emperor gets killed off, it automatically goes to the heir character. But you can actually buy, you can buy the right to be the heir, um, even as the, 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 uh, the, what's that, the senate person. And then it just moves over to you. And then we get a new set of tokens, and then you keep going. So it's like, it's not like you die and you're out of the game. You just lose the role of the emperor, which gets an extra action. Mm-hmm. So there you go. Yes. So I actually am enjoying this. So I, I've played it enough to know I like it. I'm still playing it enough to decide exactly how much, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but so far, I'm really enjoying it. There's a lot of tension, and there's a lot of... I, I really do enjoy trying to balance, like, oh, no, so is the military under control? How's the grain supply? Are the people happy? But I also really want to knock the senator off right. and, like, oh, let me, you know, make sure I'm getting a building out. Um, yeah. There's a whole lot going on, and, like, trying to use your plot cards well is a really interesting thing. Trying to decide exactly how much of your stamina you want to spend because you only have so much... Yeah, do I have an heir? Do I have things under control? Like, there's just so much happening, and you know, I really like that. The cards are really juicy, too. That's a good thing. You know, like, I thought, like, oh, these cards may be wasty. Maybe they're the same. But then just the fact that they are, they're multi-use cards. So you, you do have, you know, some cards that don't seem like they're the best, but you can use that strength to, in a multiplayer game, fight off assassins, you know, right. fight off assassinations, but also in the AI, which will try to assassinate you every round. So... You have to think about how to use those things, and you hope to God those good forum cards come out to help you out with some stuff too. So, there's a, it just it's a very very interesting game. I think the hardest thing to sell a game on is like that one to three player count. That just sounds very strange. Um, mm-hmm. It's a hard sell, so I would tell somebody to make sure they look at a video of it to see if that works for you. But um, I highly recommend this game. It, it's uh, I'm, I'm really I'm glad I sought this out, and I you know thank you for uh, Tom Pick Games for uh, sending me the copy of this game because. Uh, yeah, I'm really impressed. So, like, what kind of gamer would like this game? Like, a uh, uh, high interaction gamer? Like, a, I mean, it you have, to you need to be into the theme in order to oh, do yeah. it? It has to be high interaction because in a multiplayer situation, it is literally cutthroat. Like, it is straight up cutthroat. There is no, yeah, no way around it. You, yeah. you want to be the emperor because they have the most opportunity to score points every round. Like, it, the more people you, the more of these, you know, this kind of, like, troops you take out, you get glory diced. You have an opportunity not only to do that, but then the more these people you take out, and it ramps up during the game, so you can take a bunch of them out. You raise the happiness. Well, those give you points if you get certain past threshold. Um, you just have, you have more ways of dealing with things. If you keep all the people happy for a round and they don't starve, you get another set of points. Like, you, you're constantly able to control things, and if you're not, then you're really just controlling the Senate, you know, doing one or two things. You want to be the emperor. And in mm-hmm. order to do that, you got to take them out. Although I also do like it. So it's also not for people who pick a role at the beginning of the game and want to be that role the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Like one of the things I kind of like about Dying of Purple, actually, is you get a chance to be everybody. Yep. So if you're that kind of person, then you'll like it. If you kind of pick a role and you want to be that character and do that thing and have that special power or whatever the whole time, it might frustrate you a little bit. Yeah, I was going to say, because you're not really, you really are just starting that way. You yeah. know? It's like you're starting that way and you have to fight to be all of those people at some point in the game. If you know, yeah. if you, you know, you know, at some point, yeah. So, yeah, it's, this is, like I said, this is just like obsession. Like, this would be a game I would never even thought of a year ago. Just not, not at all. Not at all. And yeah, and I, I'm glad I, I'm glad I, I have this uh, in my hand here, man. I, I highly recommend this game. Yeah, I saw the cover art, and I was like, 
Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and so and I was like, yeah, I'll try it. And then, uh, you know, I tried it and I was like, all right, this is, this is actually, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. All right, cool. So that was Donning the Purple. Um, the designer we didn't. I don't think much of his name. Yeah, uh, uh, Peter Pe- is uh, Pet, uh, it's Petter. I'm assuming it's Petter, or it's not Peter. It's Peter, right? Uh, Peter, uh, Shake Shaky Olson. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Sorry about that. And that's Tom Pitt Games. One to three players. About an hour, hour and a half. All right, uh, and I'm I'm looking forward to it. That sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, okay, so speaking of a lot of fun, I just I decided to end the whole thing with this game, which is probably the smallest game that we're going to talk about here. But we've all played it with the biggest it just, heart. <laughs> it just makes me happy. This it's game not makes so me happy. Cute. It does. <laughs> so this game is called Cat Rescue. It is designed by Tate Wu, published by Sunrise Tornado Game Studios. So Cat Rescue is a very simple filler weight cooperative match three puzzle card game. So the entire game's a 26 card deck of cats. That's it. Just cats. And not like photorealistic cats, but like, you know, just drawings of cats that you would like Hello Kitty type cats <laughs> or or whatever. Uh, I'm sure there's like an anime word for how cute these cats are, but whatever. I'm, I'm, that's not me. Um, but anyway, on your turn. You're going to play cards into a cat shelter, uh, or either you play cards out of your hand, or you play it, just kind of kind of top deck it, reveal and do it, do whatever. Uh, but the cat shelter is the central grid, which starts off um, two by two, but then it makes has room for four by four. So then you're what you're going to do is you're going to, like I said before, you either play it out of your personal stash, which is your cat foster care, or you're going to top deck a card, which is getting a cat off the street. And you're going to put him into like this little cat shelter, which is like this training area. And it, you do it in a match three style. So like you, you you put the card kind of orthogonal to one of the cards that's in there. And when you match three, that represents training the cat or housebreaking the cat or whatever. The middle cat you flip over and that cat is ready to be adopted. So then you're going to continue to play cards into the central tableau. And you're moving cards around and you're trying to make these matches and eventually you're going to be pushing cards off the board. If you push a cat that's not ready, you have to take them into your foster home. Wah, you know, that's, that's not the, something you want. Uh, but if you find, if you manage to turn a cat face down and then push him off the board, he's ready to be adopted into somebody's home and he makes somebody happy. Yay. <laughs> it's, this game is amazing. <laughs> I've never okay 26 cards match three puzzle that does not scream theme this like we talked about how Todd Sanders his games kind of like have this kind of mathy quality to them this I didn't feel that here at all it was so cute (laughs) you so broke your own (laughs) it's the same it's the same (laughs) you've been exposed <laughs> you know what? But, and you know what, Jason? Jason, I'm gonna let you out. I'll let you out. It's Do okay. It. it is okay. It is okay. You're okay. being a choosy lover. It's okay. Right, dude, there's, I there's always an exception. Because I, because I, you know what? If somebody said this didn't have any theme, I would I would do the same thing. I would fight for it. I would say, hey, it does. You take the little, little cats out. They go somewhere. They go somewhere. This session. game like, has <laughs> so much theme. Oh my God! Can you say it's dripping with theme. I feel like I should go adopt a cat right now. <laughs> oh God, it is so. If this was a game about like, um, you know, planting, you know, things like you know, like a Uwe game where you're planting a farm or something, and you know, a turnip kind of ripen. Like I wouldn't be into this so much, but it, yeah, the the moving around the cats. It's it's a very simple like match three is something we all play on our phones. We've all played Candy Crush, Bejeweled, Puzzle yeah. Quest, or whatever it is. So like having that in a card form it feels very familiar. I didn't have to spend a lot of time with the rules because I'm familiar with the basics of it, and like you could just like I, it's it's one of the few games I can actually play like while I'm eating breakfast. You know, I just like play, lay it down, play it. I could play it anywhere. You know, four by four is not the small area, but I could literally play it anywhere with its enough table space. I love this game. <laughs> I don't even like cats. I'm not a cat person. I'm a dog what? person. No. I hate. I hate cats. Are you serious? They're, 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 I hate real life cats with a passion. They are don't so. Don't talk about my babies like that. 
they're so egotistical they pee on your stuff they don't Lies. care about you and your feelings that is not like, true at all it's so cats true. are loving oh and God. wonderful and perfect in every the, way the only good cats are cats that act like dogs that's the only good cats yeah i got one of those yeah i got one <laughs> i got one that does that <laughs> totally a dog exactly yeah um so i i love this game uh, oh my god i love my it first i want to say probably one of my first five or ten previews that i did uh for my blog and and I, this is like exactly what i want it's just like just like just like cabbage like it's a game that it's exactly what i want i want a game in my backpack that i can throw in there it doesn't even take up a lot of space at all i have a whole bunch of button shy games and this is right there with it you know, it's got like a nice little, you know, like a little velvet bag in there. And you put it in there, whip it out. And the only thing I would say, the only gripe I have with it is, is that, and I know it, you don't even have to do this, but it's got those little <laughs> little uh, cubes. And you kind of like make this Inviso 4x4 area. I don't use that. Get it's, out a of little, here. it's a little weird. I don't uh, need those. It's a, it's a little strange. But you know what? You don't even use them. You just lay the four cards out. You know, you lay the 4x4 four four out. It is, it is a little space. Takes up a little space, um, so you're going to need a table. It's not like it's a it's a table hog, but it is bigger than you think when you have four by four. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I mean that just it's nice, simple puzzle, nice, nice little puzzle, you know. And uh, if that's something you are looking for, like you know, just like a quick puzzle game, like and it's cooperative, like you can do it cooperatively. So um, that's a really good one to bring, you know, like couples and you know you and a, and a kid. And Ted, Ted he's uh, got another game. It's called uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of this. It's called A Plus. Mm -hmm. And it deals with uh, kids with ADHD. Whoa! Yeah. Really? What? Yeah. I, think it, no, I think it's for yeah. I want to say it's for autistic children or ADHD. I have it. Yeah. So I, he he's a really interesting person. I believe part of the um, the proceeds for this game also went to cat donations as well, like a cat shelter or something like that too. Mm. So yeah, I does, think I remember reading that. He, so I. I'm a really big fan of him, him and his designs, and whether I, you know, I love his games or like his games, I'm not going to be predisposed to like him, but I, I, I really appreciate what he's doing, and it, it, basically, I'm happy that it started off with Cat Rescue, <laughs> uh, because that's a really, it's a really fun game. A plus is more so like an exercise in a sense, mm -hmm. um, uh, of course, right? So it's a, it's more of an exercise, but. Definitely, you know, I, I'm really a big supporter of what what he's doing, and the games are super cheap. We're talking like ten, twelve bucks, and the turnaround is like two months. Yeah, this I is love another it. one oh of those God. ones that I backed because it was cheap, and I was just like, "Well, it's so inexpensive." Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I'm actually really glad that I did. Yeah. yeah. So we a a a, a full throated positive recommendation, a clean sweep from the panel. Clean that sweep. was cat. Cat Rescue, go ahead and check it. For a lot of these games, they're, you're not going to find them in retail. We probably should mention that. And I'm not going to put it back in post. I'm just going to mention it now. <laughs> but yeah. uh, reach out directly to the company. That's why it's very important that we're talking about the designers and the publishers. Look for them online and reach out directly because that's where you're, you're going to find a lot of these games at, direct, at their direct stores. Yeah. So, you know, or maybe like an Amazon type thing. This isn't something you're going to find that like a cool stuff or a fun again or a miniature market. Uh, the, the, these, the, these games tend to not enter regular distribution, but they're available and you're actually more likely to directly fund a creator when you buy directly from them. So definitely something to look out for. Um, I mean, Cat Rescue is going to be something I play again and again and again. It's it's not like gonna it's not like this giant blow away the best you know even like a it's not like a Friday like a a, a seminal solo card game. But I just think it's, it it just hits all the buttons for me. It's very cute, very fast. Love it. Jeez. All right, so yeah, you're that, right. You, you know what's funny is is I'm looking up Donning the Purple. Uh, I don't think that's on. Yeah, man. Yeah, you got you just got to contact these guys, man. I'm, I, I always tell people, you know, when they're looking for things, you know, they're always. Be, I have people message me constantly, constantly asking me about different games and, and where I find them, or whatever. And, I, and I, it's just like it's just like with hip hop music or any anything any genre that you like. You know, you got to go off the beaten path a little bit every once in a while. You know, and find the mm -hmm. underground. You know, like there's an underground in Fort Dance too. <laughs> That's right. You know, like you can't just go where the hit records are. You know, and and uh, you got to go find some of these people. And uh, you know, if you have a game that you love, and this is a really good piece of advice. I hope you take it, uh, you know, for what it is. If you have a design that you love, follow them on Twitter. Find out what they're doing 
you know, and like I said, start a relationship. You never know what that'll end up. You'll be end up being a fanboy of somebody, meet them at Gen Con, play their next couple games, and then you'll see where they're coming from. And they'll say, hey, this one's coming out with Asthma Day, but this one right here is coming out with Peachtree Games. <laughs> you know, and like, you really like the Peachtree Game one, but you'll never be able to buy it in the store. So right. you know where it's going to be. And, uh, you know, just pay attention to that kind of stuff like that, because there are some great designers who even make tiny little games. So, yeah. Just say, kind of give yeah. you an idea of that. All right. So uh, we have, thank you guys very, very much uh, for joining us. Another eight games. We'll probably get back to this because we're always getting Kickstarters in. Uh, so we'll get back to this in a couple of months. Uh, where can we find you guys? Oh, so you can find me at www.beyondsolitaire.net or on YouTube or anywhere else as Beyond Solitaire. All right. Yeah, you can find me at in a lot of different places, but mainly it'd be Jumbalaya Plays Games and JumbalayaPlaysGames.com. That's on YouTube and then also on the interwebs. I'm going to have a huge... I'm working on redesigning my site, so I've been kind of vacant from there for a while. And then I also have a segment on the Dice Tower um, crowd surf and show and a whole bunch of Board Game Revolution live stuff as well. All right. Thank you guys very much. I'll see you in a little bit. Thank you. Happy gaming. Thanks. Take, take care, party people. All right. Thank you for joining us on this journey, talking about eight games that are not from big publishers. We definitely chose these particular games because they don't get a lot of press. They're not, uh, you know, featured reviews on the Dice Tower and Man vs. Meeple or anything like that. You know, I think they look at some of these games, uh, but definitely not getting the coverage that most of them deserve. I think on some level, like you heard Jeremy talking about Dawn of the Purple, me with Dawn of Peacemakers, uh, you know, these games are good. These games are really good. Uh, some of these I'm actually going to have in my collection for a very, very long time. So if you have a game that is a hidden gem for you, a Kickstarter that you backed, a game you took a chance on and has been hitting your table, you've been really enjoying it, please hit us up and let us know. We will cover it. ENGN underscore podcast on the Twitter. Every Night is Game Night Facebook group, Every Night is Game Night.com. Uh, I am Pope Sixtus on BGG. We have the geek list over there with every single one of our episodes. 125 episodes, five full pages, about to hit page six. Oh my, that's a lot of episodes. <laughs> uh, but thank you so much. I could not do it without the encouragement, support, feedback. Uh, every once in a while, somebody would just leave a comment saying, you know, thank you for this episode, thank you for this segment. That makes all the difference, really. Um, you know, it just makes me want to do a better and better job for you guys. Speaking of that, our next few episodes, hopefully our next few episodes, are going to be the ENG and Solo Awards for 2018. These are big, complicated episodes, a lot to them. Hopefully I can get my S together and <laughs> make them happen. If not, you know, they'll, they'll get there eventually. So uh, look, be on the lookout for that as well. So as Anthony would say, at the end of every episode, go ahead and grab a solo game off of that shelf. And let's make every night a game night. <laughs>